Let's pray. Father God, I do thank you. What a privilege to be in your house. <laughs> oh, Lord, you, you've done yourself really good this morning. Yeah. And I, I just love you. Come on, Lord, I got I to gotta preach this morning. We will dance on the streets that are cold. The glorious bride, the great son of man. <laughs> yeah. Lord, you know I need your help this morning. I need you. Oh, Lord. We give this all in your hands, Lord, and we just give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. If I stay thinking about that, I'll never get anywhere. So we we'll just we we'll just go on. Okay. I started this series because I needed some revelation. Well, I'm getting it. Just want to let you know it's working. I'm getting more than I bargained for, and I'm having a very hard time explaining it, which is about right. I remember one day, we were, I was in Minsk, Belarus, and I was going to the Christ for the Nations Institute that they had started there. And they had me to come in as a guest teacher to come in and teach, and they said, you have one class. One class. What are you going to teach? You got a chance to teach... Missionaries. That's what it is. Christ for the Nations Institute missionaries are going to be sent out all over the former Soviet Union. And what are you going to teach them? We've got one class. I had been praying over this thing about love. It had just been just thumping me, thumping me, thumping me. And I got into this class with an interpreter, all in Russian. Class of about 30 kids. And not of them all kid kids. I mean, we're talking, you know... About 18 on up to about 25, 26, up through there. Good class of people that knew their stuff and called of God. And they would never, ever, ever ask me to come back. And the reason is, is because I didn't teach them. I didn't teach them anything. Here's why. The reason I didn't teach them anything is I tried to give them what I was getting from the Holy Spirit at the time. Hot off the Holy Spirit press. Now that message has changed my life and you've heard that message several times since. It's called How to Love. I was getting it as I was giving it. I mean, I was trying to give it. And I finally realized my interpreter hadn't talked for a little while. He's supposed to be talking every other sentence, you know? And I says, well, interpret. He says, when you finish a sentence, I'll tell him what you said. <laughs> okay, I tried. That was a mess. It was a mess. Actually, they would have called me back. It was, a, it was a very blessed time. It was very anointed. They knew the Holy Spirit was there, but nobody could tell you what was said. Nobody could tell you anything that happened. I left there, just, it just blew my mind. And I decided that I didn't want to do that all the time. I mean, I didn't want to just, uh, you can't just give it straight off the Holy Spirit press. And so what am I doing? Same thing. Okay, so whatever happens, pfft, here we go. We have now had five of these. This is number six, and this is the last of this time. <laughs> we'll be back in this subject. You can just guarantee it because someday I'm going to be released to jump into First John. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Everybody looks at Roxanne. Yeah, I told him. I told him. Okay. But we're going to be here today. Let's go. Let's go back review. Let's see what we've what we're talking about. Abides, abide, abiding. The Greek word is the Greek word meno. Meno, <sighs> to stay, literally, figuratively, in every other lee there is in there, it means to stay, to stay, uh, permanently. I mean, like, stick, stay, stay. Not visit and leave, but to, to live there, to house there, a, a stay. Now, the word abide has a little bit more to it than some of the other words that it's translated. Sometimes it's translated remain. Sometimes it's translated stay. Sometimes it's translated, um, huh? Dwell. Dwell, whatever. The word abide means a little bit more in the fact that there's life in it. Okay? 
Now, Greg fixed my coat rack down in my office this week. And he said to me, you'll never get that part off there again. It's there. I said, so it's Mano. It's, <laughs> it's there. But it's not abiding there because it's an inanimate object. It stays there. Abiding shows that there's some life happening there. Okay? And that's the part that, that really sticks in me. Staying is important, but abiding is more important. If you follow what I'm saying? Now, don't look at me like this already, folks. Listen, we've got a long ways to go. Don't, don't do that to me. Just... I would say that abiding is living at the source and letting the life come through you. Okay, it's not just about behavior, it's about the, the life source coming through. It's not just staying attached to something, it means that there's, there's life flowing through it. It means it has to be purposeful. It has to be purposeful. That is true. That part I will go with. It has to be purposeful. Okay, let's review a little bit. We started this in John chapter 14, where Jesus said, See me, see the Father. They tripped out right there, like you guys are doing, okay? They tripped out early into this whole discussion. And he says, I am in him and he is in me. If this is just positional truth and not experiential truth, then we have nothing. Now, there's a difference between, and I got in big trouble over this just recently. Um, got sitting at a table in a Chinese restaurant. And this pastor said that he was teaching this class and he is telling them the difference between positional truth and experiential truth. And I says, then you would be wrong. Maybe I could have done that a little smoother. I don't know. I tried that. It's pretty smooth. I says, no, I don't believe in that. He says, what do you mean? I says, there, there's got to be no difference. He says, no, there's, there's positional truth, which is your position in Christ, your position in the heavens, what is true about you in the spirit, but it's not what you're experiencing. I says, if I'm not experiencing it, then it's not true. He says, no. Okay, positional truth. You are living in Christ in the heavenly realms. That's positional truth. And I says, yes. Have you ever experienced being in Christ in the heavenly realms? And he says, no. I says, then you don't know what you're talking about. Because I have been in Christ in the heavenly realms. I know what it's like to have experienced that. That's got to be a theology that changes my life. I've got to experience that. Are you united with Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection? Yes. Is it positional or is it experiential? If it's not something you've experienced, then what do you have? I have got to know that I have been truly united with Christ in his death. If I haven't seen that death, I have not experienced that death, am I dead? See, it's got to be more than just, just that. I'm in him and he is in me. Permanently, they had to show a life. And the reason, the way it showed the, that it was not just ex, um, positional is he says, the Father's words is what I speak. It's the Father that does the works. This is totally experiential. He is experiencing the Father in him. He's experiencing the Father in him and has yielded to it so that the Father does the works through him. So he says, the works that I do, oh, they're not mine. The Father did them. He's not blaming the father. He isn't passing us off. Oh, that wasn't me. That was the father. Okay, this isn't about blame. This is about glory. He's saying, see how the father is working through me? Now, I, then he says to the disciples, I am in you and you are in me. What's he trying for? He's proving to them or showing to them more than positional truth. It's got to be experiential. He's trying to show them how to experience him in them and them in him. Now, understand their brain is not wrapping around this completely. Neither is mine. Neither is yours. Okay? The Holy Spirit. And then we found out we did a whole, whole message on just the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to have the Holy Spirit indwelling you? Is that positional or is that experiential? My God, it better be experiential. I have got to experience the Holy Spirit in me. And then we got into John chapter 15, where it says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. He is the true vine with true life. Now he's starting to show them life through the vine. The father is the vine dresser. Then he started talking about the pruning process, and we're going to be talking about this just a little bit this morning. But the goal is what? 
The goal is the fruit. Why do you have a vine? You have a vine to have the fruit. Okay? I know there are vines, certain vines. And I've, uh, I've been to England. I've been to England. And I've seen huge cathedral buildings made completely. The whole outside was made of flint, by the way. You know, people around here are begging to try to find pieces of flint to make stuff out of. And there, it's a throwaway stone. I mean, it's everywhere. Everywhere. I saw this whole cathedral. The whole outside of this whole huge building was all flint. Meaning what? You couldn't break into the place. I mean, <laughs> it was tough stuff. But just gorgeous. But almost the entire thing was covered in a vine. You know, ivy and different stuff. I just, I know there's vines that just cover. That's all they're for. They don't have any fruit to them. But he's talking about the kind of vine that has a fruit. What good is a vine, a grape vine, if it doesn't produce grapes? It, then it's only for show and no purpose. The problem is, folks, that we are many times in our lives vines <laughs> with no grapes. Meaning what? We've got to get rid of the show and go for the go. Okay? No religion. It's all show. That's religion. Jesus went to a tree one day, remember? It was all show and no go. He saw the tree. It was a fig tree. And it had leaves. It said in the scripture that it was not the season for figs. I mean, you shouldn't even expect figs. But if you look at a fig tree and it has leaf, it has the fruit. It has figs. And he looked at this tree and it had leaf. Even though it wasn't the season, he went and said, oh, figs. And he went over to pick figs off of this tree. And he got there and there's no figs on the tree. It was all leaf and no figs. It was all show and no go. And he said, aha, and cursed it at its roots and it withered. And the next day they came by and that thing was dead as dead could be. Freaked them all out. Why? What's the purpose? The purpose is the fruit. Not just a show. Now God's not into us being a show for him. He wants fruit off of us. When somebody comes into my life, he doesn't want me looking good so they go, ooh, wow, aren't you wonderful? He wants somebody to come into my life and pick fruit off of me. I've got to have the fruit. The idea is the fruit. Fruit is the goal. Now, do you have no fruit or lesser fruit? Then what, what happens? Pruning. We find out what the pruning is. The pruning is on the heart. It's the hardness of heart. Getting stuff that's off the heart that is sucking all the energy and not letting fruit happen. Okay. I'll just read this through quickly with you. And we're going to go over this so we can know where we're heading into this chapter. John chapter 15, 1 through 6 is the, what the first message on John 15 was and it says I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser every branch in me not bearing fruit he lifts it up ties it up cleans it off ties it up and ties it to the trestle trellis I did it again still can't get that word right okay he lifts it up and each one bearing fruit he prunes so that it may bear more fruit you are already pruned because of the word which I have spoken to you remain in me it's actually the word abide I mean, actually, it's the meno. But it shows there's life here. It's not just staying, but there's staying with the connection of life that goes through it. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch is not able to bear fruit of itself unless you abide in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. And this idea of staying, living, connected to him. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one abiding in me and I in him, this one bears much fruit because apart from me, you're not able to execute nothing. Unless one abides, remains, abides in me, he is cast out as the branch and is dried up and they gather and throw them into the fire and they are burned. Then in verse seven through 11, we continued. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, Whatever you desire, you will ask, and it shall happen to you. In this, my Father is glorified that you should bear much fruit, and you will be disciples to me. As the Father loved me, I also loved you. Abide in my love. And we're going to get stuck right here. If you will keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. The whole purpose behind this is what? To 
Be connected to him without hindrance so what is in him can throw, flow through me to somebody else. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, if you get your life in me and my words are living in you, ask what you will and it'll happen. Why? Because it's not going to be selfish prayer. It's going to be totally hidden prayer, isn't it? Isn't this cool? Now, how do you do this practically? That's, that's the part that's getting me. How do you practically abide in him? This thing of abiding in him. I'll tell you how you can get his words to abide in you. Anybody interested? Okay. Do you want to know how to make his words abide in you and alive? By doing them. <laughs> oh, what a concept. That was a... Oh, I snuck up on you on that one. See, I was a... Um, it's your obedience that's going to make them live, isn't it? What makes it a dead word? A dead word is a word that God has given you that you don't do. Does my word abide in you? If he gives you a word, can he trust you to let it live? God, how many times has he told me to do something and I didn't do it? And I missed the revelation of it. I missed the life of it. I choked the life out of that word. And then I tried to do it later without him doing it through me. But by doing it in my own selfishness, my own flesh. Tried to make that word function then. <laughs> How did that work out for me? <gasps> now, there's a bunch of dead branches. <laughs> throw them in the fire. Have you ever looked at grape wood? It's useless. A dead grapevine is useless. It has no strength. It even says in the scriptures, you can't even make a coat peg out of it. <laughs> it just breaks off. It's worth nothing but throwing in the fire. And you know how long it burns? Seconds. <laughs> Gone. <laughs> it wasn't even good for warming your hands over. Just a little, <laughs> and it was over. That's not what it's for. It's not for making wood to sit there and be dead. It's for having life flowing through it to produce fruit. That's the purpose. What is your purpose in life? It's to be there for God to flow through you to bring fruit. Then verse 11 said this, I've spoken these things to you that my joy may abide in you and your joy may be full. I love this part because <laughs> oh, we used to call churches, you know, the first church of the frigid air, you know, the frozen chosen. <laughs> Uh, you can tell that guy's a Christian. He hasn't smiled in years. <laughs> oh, that's a church. That, for communion, they just give them pickle juice. You know, they just sit there and you just look like they're just sucking on something sour all the time. Folks, is that the earmark of a Christian? If you listen to people out in the world and they talk about Christians, they're those people that have no fun. Guess what? That ain't me. That is not me. I have a real problem. You want to hear my problem? My problem is I got too much joy. I sit down in my office in here and watch a life get changed. And I sit there and start to giggle. And it's really hard to keep. I have this like uncontrollable little thing that escapes out all the time. And I snicker a lot. And I'll be sitting there and say, so what's the Lord showing you? And you're sitting there. They have their eyes closed. They don't realize. You know, they're just sitting there. And all of a sudden they go. <laughs> that tickles me. They and Jesus have just had an encounter and whatever was stopping their life is now gone. I mean, it took a sec, sec, just a second and their face lights up without their eyes even being open. And just, just, just like, you know, have you ever blown in a baby's face? Just go, in a baby's face. They don't know what to do with the sudden pressure of air. And they go, that's what their face looks like. And you go, huh, and you're like, God, that is fun. It tickles me, and then I'm tickled. And then that's too bad, because there's an anointing about this, and then I'm tickled. And then it's... But I sit there, and I laugh. And I, I get to... We had this guy come in this, this week. <laughs> we had two days with the same... One guy for two days, okay? Blew his, his head. 
Greg, would that be an accurate description? <laughs> he stayed with Greg. <laughs> so Greg got to spend time with him. The guy was not finishing sentences by the second day. It was pretty hilarious. And he had no clue how to get, I mean, how to explain what was happening in his life. And it tickled me. It was, uh, it was in there Thursday and Friday. And Thursday night, I watched his whole life change. Now, he told me Thursday morning, before we went to lunch, he told me, you know, a man, he says, I says, you will be, the, the capacity of you being totally free from pornography is huge. He says, he says, no, can't happen. I says, excuse me? One more time. <laughs> and he says, he says, I don't, I don't see how that's possible. Now that tickled me. I started giggling then, and we hadn't even had sessions. And I started, I says, boy, you're in for a ride, dude. He says, really? Yeah. He says, right after lunch. It's all yours. So right after lunch, we started. Boom. An hour after we came back from lunch, he's sitting there completely free from all perversion, all defilement sexually. Free. Free. Couldn't find an ounce of it. And so I couldn't help but just at least mock him a little bit. You know, I, I, it's got to be biblical. I don't know. It's not. I don't know if it's mocking or not. But, but I said, I said, but I thought, I thought you said it couldn't happen. Didn't you say that about 1140 this morning? You said, no, that can't happen. Okay, now let me, I'll give you a chance to reassess the situation. Can it happen? And he sat there and he looked at me and he's, he's smiling. He says, he says, yeah, it happened. I says, why the difference? What's the difference between 1140 and now other than lunch, you know? What was the difference? He had an encounter with Jesus Christ he walked in the scripture. The scripture told him what to do, and he did it. And God says, hey, if you just do the word, if my word is abiding in you, ask what you want, and it will happen. Well, we asked. The word was abiding. We obeyed what Jesus said to do. What happened? We asked. Lord, would you take this away? Okay. Gone. What happened? We were abiding in him, and his word was abiding in us. And we just float in it. Let's go on. My joy was full. Abiding, we found out last week that you abide in his love, abide in his joy, and abide in his peace. That's pretty cool. Totally connected to who he is, affecting who I am. When I'm connected to who he is, it affects who I am. I find out the real who I am that he has called me to be from the foundations of the world. If I ever start walking in the real who I am, what would happen? Yeah, that's where I'm pushing. That's where I'm pushing. Dying to my selfishness and alive to him. <sighs> okay. And we, we stopped with this last week. There's the vine. That's the big sticky part. Sticky. It looks like a stick. It's the big stick. Stickish part. Okay. <laughs> the little stickish part is the branch. Life goes through the vine, through the branch, and the outward expression is the fruit. Now, come on, that's not hard to figure, right? <laughs> we also know that there's love from the vine, not just life from the vine. But if the vine is love and I plug into the vine and I also can find joy in the, in the vine and I can also find what? Peace in the vine, meaning what? There's the spirit. What do we have is when that comes through the branch, I have it all. The outward expression is the fruit of the spirit. If I let the spirit through me, the fruit of the spirit will show up on me, won't it? Back to John 15, 7 through 11. So we're backing up into our new verses. Uh, if you remain, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, whatever you desire, you'll ask and it'll happen to you. In this, my father glorified that you should bear much fruit and you will be disciples to me. Here we go. Now follow this close. As, as exactly like in the same exact manner, as the father loved me, I also loved you. Now, Abide in my love. 
If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. See, it shows an effect. It shows that it's going to affect you in my love. As I have, as, as I have kept my Father's commandments and continue in his love. In other words, do what I've been doing. It'll work out for you. Okay, abide in my love. Okay, then verse 12 says, and this is my commandment, that you love one another as I loved you. Now, watch, what, see what he said here? He said, now, look, the Father loved me. And I am abiding in the Father. So I got the Father's love because I'm continuing in what he did. I did his commands. I'm proving that his love is working through me. Okay? So I have the Father. The Father loves me. And I loved you with the love that I got from the Father. <laughs> he says, okay. Now he looked him square in the eye and did this with just one person. He says, okay. You know, just like, okay, the Father loves me. I love the Father. I'm in the Father. The Father's love came through me and I love you. Now you love her. And they're going, ah. Uh -huh. What? Now you do the same thing in the fact that you have the relationship and let the love flow through you to somebody else. Now they went from, ah, oh, this is cool. Yeah, this is cool. Me? Do it? Huh? You just see him backpedal and waffle right here. I can't do what you, you're Jesus. I'm Thaddeus. Who even knows who I am? Now, here's the deal. All of a sudden, he's telling them to do it. He's telling them to do it. Now, does this commandment only go to the 12? Yes. Uh, 11, I'm sorry. Judas did leave. No, it does not go to just them. In fact, if I were allowed to go into 1 John, I would prove something else. But I said, so go we on. won't go. <laughs> go, mommy. <laughs> okay. The command that does the most. This is the command that you love one another as I have loved you. How come? Well, watch this. If commands are done because of love for him, right? I'm doing the commands because I love him. Then the first command comes before the second command, huh? Yes. See, the first command has to come first. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind before you do the second one, love others. So when he says, I want you to love others, what's he saying? Abide in me first. Abide in me first. And then it will work. Just like I abide, abode, abided, abided. <laughs> no, abode in my Father, and I am abiding in the Father, and His love is what I'm loving you with. Same thing. You abide in me, my words will abide in you. You can love them with it. Same exact, same exact. Same exact. As, exactly like. Well, how did he love? Committed to love, not because of an action. In other words, I'm not going to love you so that you act correctly. But see this word committed? That's a cuss word for most Christians. Mm -hmm. yep. That's a little cuss word. What do you mean committed? You mean I'm supposed to be committed? Come on, I'm out there Lone Ranger-ish. Lone Ranger is my hero, but no, that's not the way it works. Why? What is commitment? What's another word for commitment? Covenant. That's the one right there. Covenant. Another C, another C word. Covenant. Well, here's the deal. Present active subjunctive, Ron. I know you know that, right? <laughs> this is my commandment that you actually that you keep on loving one another. It doesn't give any cause for stopping at any time. That's right. <laughs> now we look back, how much of our love towards other people is conditional? Lots. I'll love you as long as you stay out of my way. As long as you tell me all that I need to hear. As long as, you know, Wow, there's, there's a, it's hard to even come up with a scenario because how many people have left churches because the pastor did one thing wrong? Okay, I'm right now just dealing with the situation. I'm sitting there just going, well, who's going to love this pastor? Who is going to love this pastor? Did he do it all right? Heavens no. Did he do more right than you're doing right by being mad at him and then trying to undermine his church? Ooh, see, that's when I start getting mean. See, <laughs> that's kind of stuff. 
Yeah, but you don't know what he did. It doesn't matter. Love him. Love him through it. Is anybody helping him get set free from his stuff? Who's going to help this pastor? Oh, well, pastors have to be perfect. And here's a little problem. If you think that pastors have to be perfect, what you just said was the, the real Christians have to be perfect. Because what you're saying pastors are is how pastor, or Christians are supposed to act. Therefore, you set the standard for yourself. So everything you expect a pastor to do is what you should be expecting yourself to do. Covenant. Now there's a word. Somebody should teach on that one of these days. Covenant. Death to independent living. What is covenant? Covenant is no longer living for me. It's living for somebody else. Okay? Covenant is living for the other person. It's living for the other. It's impossible to do without love. Absolutely, fleshly, impossible to do without love. Now, marriage covenant. We go from preaching to meddling right here. For those rock out students who want to know where my visual is today, here it is. Here's my visual. There it is. I'm wearing it. We even cleaned it today. <laughs> it's all nice and polished. Oh, you can't see it? Oh, well, here. It looks like that. <laughs> I even took a picture of it, okay? What it is, is these are grapes, and this is a grape leaf, and this is a grape leaf. These are grapes. My wedding ring is a vine with fruit. That's my wedding ring. Cool. Now, mine is done in white gold. Why? Because silver, it's not silver, it's white gold, but it's white gold. The silver color in scripture is purity, cleansing. So I have a wedding ring that continually shows me my covenant with my wife and it's based on my covenant, my being abiding in the vine. And it's based on how the purity is that he gave me. That's my wedding ring. <laughs> See? Hers is the same thing, only it's the yellow gold. Why? What's the yellow gold in scripture? Come on, somebody. Divinity. Divinity! I married the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you knew that was coming, oh, right? Holy yes, Holy all right. Yes, all right. Oh, dang. I am in so much trouble. Okay. <laughs> There's, there's our hands together. There they are, our wedding rings. Now, what is this? This is a fascinating deal. I have a covenant with this woman. Why did God make marriage? God made marriage so we would have something in the natural to understand something that is so hard to understand in the supernatural. And I have this covenant so that I could all better understand this covenant. But which is the first covenant? This covenant with the Lord. My covenant with God is a higher covenant than my covenant with her. And it's my covenant with God that empowers me to have this covenant with her. Isn't that good? Okay, marriage covenant. To stay in the relationship, to abide. Now, I'm walking along, minding my own business. Da, 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 da. Tuesday afternoon. Da, 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 da. Am I still married? Yes. <laughs> the second... I step out of that relationship is the second I'm in trouble. I can stay married to my wife 24-7. I can stay knowledgeably understanding that covenant 24-7. Now, you're married. Some of you are actually married people. How's your covenant with your wife? That relationship with her is such a neat thing. When are you thinking about not, you know, how, when does somebody walk up and say, are you married? And you go, married, yeah, uh, yeah, yes I am. <laughs> and it shocks you to remember, oh yeah, I'm married. Yeah. I'm trying to remember. You know, yeah. How do you know you were married? You were there when it happened. You weren't totally there. I know some of you. You were kind of la-la land, but you were still there when it happened. Okay? How do you know your covenant with God? Can I, am I abiding in my covenant with my wife? Yes, I abide in that covenant. I live there. There's life that flows there. It is a living organism. 
It's a wonderful thing. Do I have a covenant with my God? Yes, and it is an, a living organism. It's an abiding thing. I can be in that covenant with him 24 seven. Can I think of it 24 seven? Actually, I can. Mm -hmm. In the middle of everything. Thinking of all sorts of stuff. Now, <laughs> I sent something to Jared on, on the computer that he hasn't gotten yet. <laughs> and I found this website that's in a Christian, uh, Christian apologetics. Now, how many of you like apologetics? Apologetics is the science of arguing, <laughs> in essence. <laughs> it's how to, how to give all the evidence for something, and this is a, a Christian apologetics website. And I stumbled on it. I mean, it just kind of like fell onto this thing. And this thing is a, um, what it is, it's a you're refuting relativism. Okay, what in the world is relativism? Relativism is this thing that is coming out through the postmodern understanding that says the truth is relative. It may be true for you, but it's not true for me. Now, this guy, I don't know who wrote this. I have no idea who this guy is. And he wrote this, and you can tell he's, he's, a, he's a brain burner. He's a, he's a cognitive kind of a guy. And he wrote this article. I got I to gotta print it off. You'd love this thing because it is an exercise in logic that is phenomenal. But I sat there and read through this thing and it's supposed to be, oh, you know, all intellectual. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. To me, it was a comedy routine. <laughs> it was the funniest thing I have read in a long time because it made total sense. But the way he says these things, and if you don't pay close attention, you're never going to follow him. You're going to, huh? You know? I sat back and laughed at this thing. It was, it was perfect. Absolutely. I, I got to print it off and hang it on the wall here for people to just come by and just see how many people go. What? You know? Because what an exercise in logic. And he goes through seven, eight points on how come relativism doesn't work. And it's, it's stuff like, well, if, if truth is relative. If my truth is not your truth, you know, then, and he starts down the line. But to stay in this relationship and abide, okay, it's going from the natural into the supernatural, understanding how this thing works. Now, we talked about this last week. We start with me, and then there's, there's God, okay? We, I always start with me because that's usually where our focus is, okay? I tend to start there. <laughs> Should be on God. But what's the first command? Love the Lord your God. Are you with me, Toby? <laughs> okay, just checking. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. But we love him, why? Because he first loved us. Because he first loved us. There it is. Okay. This is the primary relationship. This is number one. This is the abiding in God. Now look at this. If my focus is on God and he is focusing on me, I am in him and he is in me. What's going to happen here? It's going to change me, isn't it? Am I going to be able to stay the same if I do this? No, I will have to change. I will be like who he created me to be if I'll do this. Okay, here we go. I love him because he first loved me. Actually, he gave me the love to love him with, which gives me revelation of his love for me, which gives me the love to love him with, which gives me the revelation of his love for me, which gives me the love to love him with, which gives me the revelation of his love for me, which gives me... The love to love him with. He is the love we love him with because God is love. But I can't quote that because that's out of 1 John. <laughs> Only then will I have the love to do number two. Because if I don't do number one first, I don't have the power to do number two. And number two is to love others as I love myself. As what? As I love myself. Which self? Not the sinner self that I've always hated, the, the creep that does all the stupid stuff but the one who God has created because water pipes get wet. When I know his love for me, I know that he loves me because I am lovable. I will love the real me. And you're saying, but I don't love the real me. That's why we need to get together and figure out why the false you is the one that's living in power. This makes too much sense, doesn't it? Okay. What's the best thing I can tell somebody else? God loves them. What is true ministry? True ministry is helping others in their relationship with God, right? Mm -hmm. So what is missing out of the chart? 
The arrow that's missing is the arrow that comes back from others to me because there is no scripture that says I am to get my love from somebody. And when I keep trying to get my love from somebody, I keep trying to get it out of them, get them out of them, that makes them God to me. It's a whole different thing. Now, since they're close, I'll just pick on these guys because why not? <laughs> Jesus. Okay, that's why. Okay. <laughs> If Brian is trying to get love from Jamie, the pressure on Jamie to perform is huge. Will she ever perform well enough? No. So he'll be disappointed and then he'll keep trying to extract that from her. And the more he tries, the more she'll try to block off and therefore the less love he will actually end up getting. So what will he do? Push harder, squeeze her off more. They will die. If she tries to get her love from him, what's going to happen? Same thing. And then he'll feel confined and he's out of here. How many marriages fail because they're trying to get love from the other one? Most of them. Because they got into those marriages for the wrong reason, thinking that the person they're marrying is going to take care of them. And then when that person doesn't do what they're supposed to do, then it all gets chewed up. <laughs> The right people come on this one? Are we paying attention? <laughs> so let's change his heart. Let's get him born again. <laughs> let's, vaguely, familiar. vaguely familiar. Let's get him to where he's getting his love from God is love. And he works on this relationship with him and God. He gets love from God and God loves him and he gets more revelation of God's love for him which gives him more love to love him with which you know, you know that whole thing. All of a sudden he turns around and he looks at Jamie and goes, Wow. It has nothing to do with me getting love from her. It has to do with my covenant, which says I am to give love to her. Where is he going to get the love to love her with? From the source of who is love. Now, is that going to be satisfying to Jamie? It should, unless her eyes are stopped up, unless her heart is hardened, and then it'll take some ministry time to break through, but it will break through. Love does break through. Amen. Am I making sense? That was a marriage seminar in a nutshell, right there. Because this is covenant. This has nothing to do with getting love from somebody. It has to be giving love to somebody. And this is still, marriage is not a 50-50 proposition. It is a 100-0 proposition. I give 100 of me, expecting no in return. Because that's the ministry I have to her. Now, how come I have this one? How come I have this one? Because I have that one. I have covenant to my wife because I have covenant with my God. You know what's really sad? I haven't even started yet. This is still review. Here we go, John 15, 13. <laughs> oh yeah, greater love has no one than this. Oh God, you guys know where I'm heading. Some of you have no clue where I'm heading because you haven't heard this yet. Greater love than this no, has no one that anyone should lay down his life for his friends. And that's the only time you'll ever hear me say it that way. Because that is a wrong translation. And what's the right translation? Is greater love than this has no one that anyone should lay down his soul for his friends. I got such an indoctrinated crowd here. <laughs> if you have, if it's life. I should have a conference about this. I should. Yeah. What's up with that? Okay. Now. How much have we taught on this? Whole bunches. But look at the context now of what it is. The context is abiding in him. The context is abiding in him. Where do I lay down my soul? I lay down my soul at the feet of the Father. I know on the left side of the stage, Rick always says, it's right over here. Okay. Okay. I lay down. Why? Because when I lay down my soul, what am I doing? I'm getting rid of my soulish life and I'm plugging into the life of the Father. I am abiding in Him and when I abide in Him, it gives me the love to love them with. Does this make sense? Yep. Isn't that cool? Dying to selfishness, only seeing as He sees. How do I lay down my soul? I lay down what I think what I feel and what I want at the foot of the Father. And I pick up what he thinks, feels, and wants. How do I pick it up? I pick it up by abiding. 
I pick it up by joining in him and letting his life flow through me. The whole thing about abiding is right there, isn't it? <laughs> I got excited right there. That was good. We get our love from the Father exactly as Jesus did. How do I know that? Because it says so in 1 John. Later. <laughs> It is our soul that is the hindrance to being the branch and bearing the best fruit. See, this is the part that we have to get at. It's absolutely at Gethsemane when he said, it's not my will, but yours. What was he doing? He was laying down his soul. He was making sure that dude was laid down. Mm -hmm. Had he laid it down before? Yes. Oh, yeah. Clear back in John 10, we talked about the good shepherd is the one that lays down his soul for the sheep. He knew about this, but boy, when he got to Gethsemane, he knew the importance of where he was going, and he made sure his soul was laid down. It had nothing to do with his soul, what he wanted. It had to do with what the Father wanted. Okay, it is our soul that is the hindrance to being the branch and bearing the best fruit. What's in your soul that's causing the, the life flow to be hindered? That's what we're getting at. That's what our whole ministry, time, that's what our whole face to face is all about, is finding out the areas that hinder the life flow from the vine through the branch. John 15, 14 says, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Doing because of the love for him shows a relationship before the doing. Relationship before the doing and then the doing happens and it shows a furtherance of the relationship because of the doing. Okay? And the reason for the doing is the relationship. I'm not going to stay here very long because we're going to go on. This is not manipulation to cause action. And I had to throw that up there. We don't manipulate people to get them to act better. <laughs> we don't? Well, we do, but we shouldn't. Maybe that's the way I should put it, right? We're not supposed to be doing that, okay? But we have a tendency to manipulate people to try to get them to act the way we want them to act. Is that the way it works? How's that working out for us? Is that working out for anybody here? Anybody got a PhD in that one? But in verse 15, it says, I no longer call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his Lord does, but I call you friends because all things which I heard from my father are made known to you. His view versus our view. Next week, I'm starting a whole series on relationships. And the first one next week, they're going to be doing next week, we're going to be showing you how to biblically look at yourself. Yeah, I should write a book about that. Okay, <laughs> I am right now, halfway through it, okay? His view versus our view. Is there a difference? Actually, there is. I'll show that to you next week. Okay, a friend of God has no soul of his own. Now, that was a barn burner sentence, wasn't it? <laughs> Did you write that one down? This is not an area of pride. I'm a friend of Jesus. Okay, we got to watch that. I'm a friend of Jesus. No, that's not an area of pride, man. That, is, that is, should be a humbling thing. I'm a friend of Jesus. Whoa. Is there responsibility for being a friend of Jesus? Yeah. I had a guy one time, one time, he walked up to me and he says, I want to be your friend. And I says, are you sure? He says, yeah. You sure you want to be my friend? He says, yeah. Okay, you better pray about that, but okay. <laughs> you sure? Yeah. I said, okay, we'll see how it works. So I started being his friend. About three months into this thing, he walked up to me after church one night, and he, we were in prayer. It was heavy duty, and he came up to me and says, being your friend is no picnic, and walked away. <laughs> hey, that's right. Amen. <laughs> I asked you if you were sure. I know. I know. I got it. <laughs> I laughed at him. I don't understand. If I told you his name, you'd freak out. You'd just love it. Okay. Being a partner in his purpose. What is a friend? Because I'm not calling you slaves because the slave does not know what his Lord is doing, but I called you friends because all things which are heard from the Father are made known to you. We are a partner in his purpose. Do you have a purpose in life? Roxanne and I were talking about this just yesterday. She says, think about it. I mean, have you ever really thought about it? She got really, just think about this. Here's this ball of dirt spinning in, the, in space. And you live your life, and what do you do? You just, you get educated, or you try, or whatever, and you live your life, and you try to get a job, and you try to make money. 
For what? For what? And there are people on this planet that their whole life is just wrapped up in what's here. How silly. No wonder there's so much drug abuse and alcohol and everything else out there. Why? What hope is there? If this is it, oh my God. But this isn't it. Man, we, have, we get to be part of his purpose. <sighs> okay, verse 16. I have not cho- you have not chosen me, but I chose you out and planted you. This is, this is where I'm heading with this. I wanted you to see this part of this, this passage. I have, you have not chosen me, but I chose you out and planted you that you should go and should bear fruit and your fruit should remain. That whatever you ask the Father my name, he may give you. This is getting the power source correct. This isn't about you choosing me. You are not the God here. I'm the God and I chose you. Now, don't get into the Calvinistic thing that only a few of us are chosen. The rest are going to go to hell and there's nothing they can do about it. Hey, can't go down that road. Okay, no. He says, I chose you. Who did he choose? Man, he chose us. Mankind is not in charge to choose God. God was in charge to choose man. I chose you out. And I planted you. Now, he chose out these 12. And he is talking to the 11, actually. He is talking to them. He says, I chose you. You are the 11. I chose you specifically. And I planted you. Why? That you should bear fruit. Planted in him by relationship. I I chose you. you. You 11. I chose you guys. And I planted you. That you should bear fruit. And your fruit, the goal is the good fruit. And that your fruit abide. Your fruit uh, remain. Now, since I'm picking on Brian anyway, it's almost two years. We had a purity conference two years ago, and Brian came to it, and he had been ministered to by Joe before he came. He was set up <laughs> by God, the Holy Spirit, and a bunch of us, okay, a praying wife, and a, you know, and Joe, and us, and we all been praying for him. It's been, it was pretty funny. Then he came to a purity conference. Got born again. Now, he's fruit. He is fruit of our ministry. It's it's stuff that because of our ministry, something has grown and has come out of it. It's not just the fruit of the Spirit. There's all sorts of kinds of fruit, right? And he says, now, I, I planted you guys that you should bear fruit and your fruit abide. So the idea behind him abiding in God is what? That's the goal of this thing. Your fruit should remain. Your fruit shall abide and stick. The answers are in the purpose of your living. The answers, and then you should you ask the Lord my name and he'll always give it to you. The answers are in the purpose for you, of your living. Then verse 17, these things I command you that you love one another. And that's where I'm just going to stop it right there. The proof of everything is in the love. Friends do his commands. We are in him. We will do this. If we are in Christ, you will. If you are in Christ, you will love. Amen. Mm-hmm. Amen. Just simple. So if you're not loving, then that part of your life is not in Christ. Uh, there's no other way around it. That's it. Now, the proof of abiding is in loving. Now, this is not First John, this is Jude. So it's okay. <laughs> Jude, chapters 20 and 21. I'm just seeing who's paying attention here. You know, it has one chapter. It's okay. Verses 20 and 21 says this. But you, beloved, building yourselves up by your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, eagerly awaiting the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to everlasting life. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to give you a practical thing that's going to keep you plugged in to the Spirit. Anybody want a really super practical way to keep abiding? But you, beloved, building yourselves up by your most holy faith. Building yourselves up. Building up my inner man. The word means literally to edify, to build up, to make it strong, to build it up. Uh, You know, you, you build something, you make it stronger, structurally sound. You keep building it, making it bigger, making it stronger. But it says by your most holy faith. What is faith? Faith is trust in a person, isn't it? 
Faith is trust in a person. Do you have faith in Jesus Christ? Yeah, that, because you trust Jesus Christ. Faith and trust are the same thing. So we get off to this faith thing. What is faith? Faith is this faith. No, it just means trust in a person. Okay? Building yourselves up by your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. What in the world is praying in the Holy Spirit? It's called tongues. Now, this is going to be really fun. I'm going to break this down for you real here. Praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Let's talk about keeping myself in the love of God. How does, the, how does this work? It works like this. Building and praying in the Greek are continual action. Building yourselves up by your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Spirit. It shows continual and repeated action. It's something you're always doing. Are you built up enough yet? No. So therefore you should be praying. <laughs> Have you prayed enough? Have you finished your prayer praying? <laughs> the more you look at that, that's ridiculous. That's ludicrous. That's, of course, we need to be praying more. Okay, Building and praying are continual action. As you do them, there is an effect. And the effect is something that will always happen. Because it says it will. Right there, it says it always will. You keep yourself in the love of God. Now, wait a minute. Think of this. Who is God? God is love. Right? Didn't we talk about how if I can just plug into him and have the life and the flow of his love coming through me that it will love to somebody else? Keeping myself in the love of God is doing what? Abiding in him. Because he is love. Follow me here. I stay in him. Okay? I keep myself in the love of God. It's something that happens. If I'll do the other continually, this is the effect. I'll keep myself in the love of God. Now, have you ever found an area in your life where you didn't think God loved you? Yes. How come I can think he loves me in this area and don't think he loves me over here? The problem is, here I have a hardness of heart that keeps me from seeing who he is. I'm not abiding in him here. In this part, I know he loves me. I don't have a hardness of heart that is there. It shows we're compartmentalized, huh? We have areas that we need to work on. So in this area, I do something. I'll do something here so that I will learn that God loves me here. Okay? Now, I will go to somebody and say, I have a hardness of heart here. Would you help me? We'll do a face-to-face -face thing. We'll find out what is hindering me right here. Something that I have learned, a lie I believed, something that's going on. I'll find out what it is. But there's something I can do before I get there. Because praying in the Spirit takes you into the Spirit. Requires abiding to function. For me to function in this, for me to stay in the love of God, I must abide. Huh? How do I get there? Well, it's from natural to supernatural. I've got to go from the natural to the supernatural. How do I do it? Well, it's the called speaking in tongues, praying in tongues. It's your prayer language. It talks about that in 1 Corinthians. It talks about the difference between praying in my understanding and praying in the Spirit. Now, therein lies our problem. I found your problem. I found your problem. It's in your need to understand. My understanding is way too important. My understanding is way too important to me. But in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, it says what? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Now, we're now right back to love the Lord your God with all your heart. Trusting him, loving him shows that relationship, doesn't it? How can I say I love him if I don't trust him? <laughs> huh? Okay. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Now, wait a minute. How many of us are fulfilling that one? <laughs> we have a liar in the back of the room. Okay. <laughs> Not lean on your own understanding. Folks, this is huge, isn't it? Talk about practicality. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll direct your paths. Don't rely on your understanding. The need to understand is trusting in me, isn't it? If I'm not going to do something I don't understand, I mean, that's trusting in me. Well, we find out out of Jeremiah 17, 5 through 8, <laughs> that if I trust in me, I curse it. If I trust in God, I bless it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. 
Tongues is trusting him totally. Why? You don't need to know what you're praying about. You can't know <laughs> what you're praying about. There's no way to know. Now, every now and then I ask the Lord, Lord, what do I just pray? And he tells me. It's called interpretation. I can interpret, you know, at times. I don't do it all the time. It would take too much time for me to do it all the time. I trust him to pray in the Holy Spirit, keeping the spirit realm at hand. Now, no, let's back up here. There we are. But you, beloved, building yourselves up by your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God. Now, well, watch this carefully. Now, I know the difference between tongues that are foreign interpretation that is a message to the body of Christ. That's not what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be praying in my prayer language. It's none of your business, but I'm doing this by example today. Okay? But for me to pray in the Holy Spirit means what? I kick in a spiritual function that does not require my understanding, and yet my trust is that God is going to walk through it. But I have found out that if I'm building myself up in my most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, I can keep in the love of God. So I got this area over here where I am not feeling the love of God. Does God love me in my finances? I know he loves me in my ministry, but does he love me in my finances? If I don't feel he loves me in my finances, there must be a hardness of heart. What am I going to do? How can I do this? Well, it's like this. I bring up the aspect of my finances and I say, Lord, I need help in my finances. What am I doing? I'm putting my faith in him, building my inner man up with my most holy faith. I'm praying in the Holy Spirit and I'm going to keep myself plugged into the love of God and find out in this area that he does love me. He does love me in my finances. Dang, this makes way too much sense. The more my soul is in charge, the less the spirit is working. I must die to me to connect to him. I must submit to the pruning process. And when I pray in tongues in an area, what am I doing? Most of the time, I'm praying, though the Lord just show me what the hindrance is. And I can deal with it. You know what he's going to do? He's going to show me that hindrance. Is it going to be pretty? No. If I humble myself to deal with it, it will be dealt with. If I get all cranked up about it, I'll quit praying about it. He is living in me. He is loving in me. As I live in him, he is living through me. The connection of living and loving and flowing. Now, I could start whole, the whole series on learning how to change your identity. And think of this. When you step into Christ, what are you doing? You're abiding. That's where abiding happens. Do you ever have to leave his presence? No. You can abide there. Do we? Not often. We have to remind ourselves who we are and what Jesus has done. The more I yield, the more he can do. Am I letting him do what he wants to do? Am I? Oh, Lord, overwhelm my life. Did you get something out of that? <laughs> I, just, I keep telling you, this isn't about you. This is about, I needed this. But come on along for the ride, because we're getting this. Now, you're going to see now from now on, Every message we come up with is what's going to happen. We're going to say, but see, that's abiding. Ah, what have we done? We've sown the seed in the spirit realm for us to get it. Do I expect us to have a major grip on this? No. What do I, what do I expect us to have? The seed of it. And it will grow in us. But I'll tell you what's happening is I have never had in all my series I've never had as many people walk up to me and tell me this is messing with them like this one is messing with them and I said breaks my heart 
that it have to mess with you, you know? Just tears me up. Every time I saw you, I kept telling you that. <laughs> yeah, terrible. but I, it's, it's coming from a lot of people. They're saying, wow, this abiding thing is getting through to me. Okay, that's a good thing. I'm glad. I'm glad. So what's our practical application for the day? How you doing? Are you abiding? Are you abiding? Huh? I tell you. We should get it, shouldn't we? What's the Lord told you today? Well, let me ask you this question. This is the final question. Is the word that he's told you today abiding in you? Because you're going to ab apply it. Now, by the way, if anybody here is real offended at tongues, come talk to me. I'll tell you about offense. Don't be offended at tongues. Let me, if, if, if you've never grown up with tongues, if tongues is a bother to you, hey, it's all cool. Let's just walk together. It's not enough of a thing to break fellowship over. Okay, but I'll tell you, it has changed my life. I will never, never compromise. People say, well, just don't talk about the tongues thing. Oh, I always talk about the tongues things. Even when I'm the only charismatic in the room full of pastors, I still talk about the tongues thing. Why? Because I like messing with them. No, I don't. That's, well, yes, I do. But that's not the reason why. The reason why is because they have to see that it is something is functional in somebody's life that is somebody they know. And it won't kill them, and it's not of Satan. <laughs> so I don't do it in front of them. I'm not that stupid. But I do talk about it. I mean, there's a whole room full of pastors. And of course, the first thing I do, usually when I bow my head to pray with people, first thing I do is break into tongues. <laughs> Which is one of those little tricky things. Hey, Father. <laughs> uh, because I'm long since quit trying to rely on my understanding on how to pray. If it's only my understanding that is the, the main thing of their prayer, they're not getting the kind of prayer they need. My prayer goes way beyond that. I'll pray with my understanding. Oh yeah, I pray with my understanding a lot. But see, here's something. When we pray over here in our circle over here, I hear very little tongues. I have asked on several occasions, people, please, pray in tongues. If you're not praying and understanding, if you're not praying out loud, pray in tongues. At least pray in tongues. Pray in tongues now. Do it. Let's go. This morning, I heard very little tongues. I'm just trying to bolster you just a little bit. Really? My prayer language is not something for you to hear and understand. You can hear me doing it, but you're eavesdropping. It's between me and my God. But there is a tongue that is spoken in front of the congregation that must be interpreted. But anyway, it's all good. Let's pray. <laughs> Father God, I do thank you, Lord, for today. And Lord, it's out there. It's in the spirit realm. It's sown. And may it bring up much fruit. And Lord, I thank you. We bless it. We thank you, Lord, for abiding. You do live in us. And your Holy Spirit lives in us. And Lord, your word should live in us if we would let it live. And Lord, may we live in you, abide in you, that we may see all the beauty that you have for us. We give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.